<laughs> so, um, welcome everybody to the UBC Department of Emergency Medicine Provincial Grand Rounds for September. Um, and uh, thank you very much all for coming. A special thank you to um, uh, Tracy Pickett, who has agreed to be our first uh, speaker of the academic year. Um, Tracy has a long history in emergency medicine and has recently done some pretty amazing things that are unique. And she's going to talk to us about uh, forensic aspects and clinical aspects of strangling, which is a, an interesting topic. So Tracy trained at, uh, in the UBC program, uh, was on staff at St. Paul's for a long time, um, is working mostly at VGH now clinically. But um, she has a letters behind her name that nobody else has. So she did a master's in Australia in forensic medicine, and she has her fellowship in emergency medicine in Canada. She also is the only Canadian, let me see if I get this right, who has a fellowship in forensic uh, clinical? Clinical forensic cl medicine. Cl clinical forensic medicine from Australasia. So um, pretty amazing as she sort of goes down. She's the medical director of the sexual assault service. And so... She has these special expertise, and we said, well, what, what stuff do we need to know about this? And, um, and Tracy has a special interest in the clinical and forensic aspects of strangulation injury. And so that's what we're going to hear from her. So we're, ex so we're so excited. She was recently promoted to a clinical professor level, and so congratulations on that too, Tracy. Thanks. You can take over. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. So thank you, everybody, and thank you, Jen, for having rounds beforehand. So there were actually people here. I was getting a little lonely at the start. Um, and uh, it's really great that there's uh, some eMERGE people here. But also thank you to, I think I see a few pathologists, Eric, and I think Matt's there. Um, I also invited Crown to this and uh, Crown Council just because um, I think one of our really important roles in medicine is to be an educator, and that's part of what I want to do is educate hopefully you guys, but also the other sort of greater other people who need to know about this as well. So um, strangulation injury, uh, why did I pick this? Well, I have some personal experience with it, not that I've strangled my kids, uh, but uh, certainly having deal, had to deal with patients in the emergency department. But I also kind of recognize that it's not something that we really recognize very well or that we do a very good job of in emergency medicine. So. What we're going to talk about, uh, just some, you know, my objectives here is why strangulation, a bit about terminology. I thought I'd throw in some stuff about Canadian law. Just Forensic medicine means the interface of medicine and the law. And uh, clinical forensic medicine is like forensic pathology, but it's on people who aren't dead yet or people who are going to become dead. So it's that, that intersection of medicine and law. And so um, we're going to talk about strangulation a little bit and Canadian law and recognition of strangulation injury. Just because, again, it's something I don't think that we necessarily do very well. And then um, a proposed strangulation investigation pathway. Because, again, sometimes I think people may recognize that there's something going on, but don't really know what to do about it. And uh, some references and resources and fire questions at me. You can stick your hand up any time. Um, hopefully, everybody in the other places can hear, and, uh, and we'll kind of get rolling here. So why strangulation? You know, it's, it's kind of a weird topic. And just sort of putting it out there. How many people sitting in this room have seen a strangulation victim that they know about? Okay, all right. Uh, let, me, let me take a, a different tack on this. How many people in the room or in the other rooms have seen somebody in the emergency department and, have asked, and the patients asked for the morning after pill? Really? Come on. I mean, most, of you, most of you, I would have thought. Okay. How many people of those, those ones that you, where you, you've asked, you know, the patient comes in for the morning after pill, you've said, was this because of sexual assault? Good. One, two. I'll have to say that as an emergency doc, that was never really on my radar when I sort of was doing just emergency medicine. You know, birth control pill, here you go, see you later sort of thing. Now I work for the Sexual Assault Service as well. Um, sexual Assault Service, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of background. We see about 350 patients a year through VGH um, who are sexual assaults. Um, we know the numbers are probably a lot higher. And, uh, and, and I really got an understanding that, you know, sometimes when people come in for the birth control pill, 
they're actually, they're the victim of a sexual assault. So now as an eMERGE doc, when somebody comes in and says, can I have the morning after pill, I say, can you tell me a little bit about this or do you want to tell me a little bit about what might have happened here? And I'm finding out, you know what, you ask the question, you find out the answer. Well, strangulation is the same thing, okay? So, you know, there's a lot of people who kind of come in, a little hoarse, a little, you know, oh, I've got a sore throat, you know, and don't, people don't ask the question, why do you have that sore throat? Why are you having difficulty swallowing? And uh, now that I'm doing sexual assault, I actually ask people the same thing. Have you been strangled? Well, guess what? More than 30% of my people that I see through sexual assault service have been strangled. When I start asking the question outside of the sexual assault service and in the eMERGE, why is your throat sore? Or why do you have that mark on your neck? Guess what? They're strangled too. So I think we don't, do, we don't necessarily do the, the justice of asking people questions. So why do we want to know about strangulation? Why, why is it important? Well, you know, it can kill people and other things, but this is why, okay? And that's victims of a prior attempt at strangulation. So somebody who's have survived a strangulation are seven times more likely to become a victim of a homicide, all right? Um, and you sort of think, well, what is my role in the emergency department? It's really easy to say, oh, you know what? You're breathing and stuff is fine. You can go. But we actually have some duty to care for these people, even if it's just letting them know that they can come back to the emergency department. So some Canadian headlines. I just, these are just random cases that I kind of have remembered or picked up in the in fairly recent past. Alberta Healthcare's worker strangulation scene described 2011. That was somebody who um, went, did a home visit like as a mental health uh, worker and got strangled. Uh, these are all deaths, by the way. Angela Wilson's killing shocks Clearwater, BC, two years ago. Gian Gameshi, what's the overcome resistance charge? Strangulation of Kathy Reed after drug binge was not a quick, painless death. So that's a quote from um, the prosecution. Crossbow attack victims died of bolt, arrow injuries, and strangulation. That was just two weeks ago. So these are the ones that we know about. These are the ones that make the headlines. But um, there's an awful lot more of this happening that we're, we're not aware of. So why is it important from an ER perspective? Um, Non-fatal strangulation is reported in 10% of abused women and 43% of domestic violence-related homicides. Almost all women who've experienced violence have sought help from at least one resource. That also means eMERGE, right? We see these people all the time and we don't necessarily recognize it. Women who've been sexually assaulted by an intimate partner are less likely to seek medical care. We know that too. Um, uh, there is a subset of people who come into the sexual assault service um, where they are repeatedly um, assaulted by the same person. Um, and in fact, the majority of our cases through the sexual assault service, it's an intimate partner sort of um, relationship. And I can talk a little bit more about sexual assault and stuff um, afterwards. Um, extra genital injuries. So injuries outside of the genitals, including strangulation, are somewhere between two and ten times more common than genital injury and sexual assault. And uh, it depends on whose papers you read. So most strangulation cases produce minor or no visible neck injuries. Now this comes, I've got all my references listed at the end, so you guys, if you're interested in this, I can give them to you. But what it means is that more than 50% of people don't have any visible findings whatsoever with a strangulation injury. And 35% of people... Um, have visible injuries, only 15% of these, and this is off of a case series with 300 patients, only 15% actually have injuries that are worth even photographing. So you just, you know, that you, you don't always see it. So there's often some sequelae of that, and we're going to um, go into that a little bit, but documentable symptoms, okay? Difficulty swallowing or a bit of hoarseness. Um, it's a gendered crime. Uh, again, I recognize that what we're seeing is kind of a skewed population with the sexual assault service, but of this series, which is actually one of the biggest series, um, case series looking at survived strangulations, 300 patients, 299 of them were um, victims were women. So, um, most people don't strangle somebody to kill them. They do it to show that it's a power thing and that they can kill them. They can kill this person at any time. And uh, there's lots of sequelae. We, again, we sometimes, you know, get an inkling of that with eMERGE because, you know, these people come in with PTSD or repeat visits or substance abuse or other sort of things. 
And there's been some legal discordance. It's only really sort of being, I will say, addressed. I won't say being rectified now. It's, re it's is being rectified in the States. But in Canada, it's not illegal to strangle somebody, which I find really interesting. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But are you kind of with me on that? Any questions about sort of why it's important? I'm not, I don't want to say we're all doing a bad job, but I think, I think we can improve what we're doing. So why does language matter? Well, it's because patients will tell you things and we will interpret things differently than what the patient is necessarily telling us because we have a medical background. And it happens all the time. You know, you get asked by a lawyer or somebody else to just describe the injuries to the hip. Well, to us, the hip means the actual hip joint, not the whole hip region. So, um, so some pretty important definitions. And so when you're searching and stuff too, um, the, the definitions become important. So what's suffocation? Pillow to the face, something obstructing the airway at the mouth and nose, okay? Choking is one. The people always say, he choked me, or I got choked, okay? Choking is when you gag on a hamburger, right? Like, it's something in your upper airway um, that impedes ventilation. It can also be a gag or something stuffed in your mouth, right? So strangulation is the big one that we're sort of, I'm trying to focus on. But it's asphyxia of the closure of the blood vessels and, the, and or the air passages of the neck as a result of an external compression. And there's lots of terminology that even goes with that, okay? So that we talk about ligatures, like ropes and cords and stuff. Talk about manual with hands. Um, it can be hands, or it can also be like an arm bar, okay, or a, a choke hold. And in fact, I, I'm not advocating that maybe you guys do this, but one of the things that I do, it, the, <laughs> this is kind of a weird sort of thing, I carry around my head. And when I have to talk to Crown, <laughs> I have the head. And when I have to talk to court, I talk to head. But what it means is that you can actually hand this over to somebody and they can show you what happened. So, you know, an arm bar like this is going to produce different injury than this, or than this, or than this, okay? So it's a sort of a, you should see me trying to get this across the border. This, in fact, actually I had more trouble getting my shampoo across the border than I did with the head, which says some little thing about the border security, but. Anyways, um, so, so different forms of strangulation are, are different, um, have different mechanisms. Hanging is a constriction band tightened by gravitational weight. Do you have to be standing to be hung? Hanged, I should say? No, right? You can actually hang yourself with gravitational weight and hang yourself off of beds and things. And traumatic asphyxia. So somebody's sitting on the chest or on the body. Um, what was the, uh, the chap in the state? So, you know, the police officers were sitting on him, and the comment was, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Yeah, that's right. So those, those are all sort of forms of um, different ways of impeding airways. Okay, segue into Canadian criminal code. So in Canada, you can't be strangled for, you can't be strangled. <laughs> you can't be charged for strangling somebody. You can be charged with assault or aggravated assault, or assault causing bodily harm, sexual assault, attempted murder, or this generic sort of overcoming resistance. So we'll talk a little bit more about overcoming resistance. But choking, so this is a quote from um, Gian Gameshi's lawyer. Um, the choking is not an offense in and of, itself, in, of, in and of itself. It's choking to commit another offense. So that's actually what it is defined as in the criminal code. Plus, in order to have the charge actually stick, the victim must have resisted. So what that means is, with, is that there's a higher burden of proof if you're trying to prove that somebody was strangled. So, so the idea is, this is the actual wording, I'm not going to go through it, but it's with the intent to enable or assist himself or another person to commit an offense. So just to try and strangle somebody to make them unconscious is not actually prosecutable under this strangulation law, um, which is kind of problematic, you know, if you think about it, because strangulation kills people, and uh, it's one of those ways that you can kill somebody without leaving a mark. Um, 38 states, actually, I think it's up to 42 now, but um, have passed strangulation laws. Uh, I think that's up from 22 about two years ago. So there's a big motion in the states to get this under the, the laws. Uh, the last time this was really looked at in Canada was in 2006. Uh, I think that there's going to be a little bit more, um, more impetus to actually look at this. Uh, 
recently now, especially in light of Gian Gameshi. Um, this was a, quite an interesting thing. Of 89 cases involving choking or strangulation between 1990 and 2006, so that's just in itself a comment of 16 years, like not quite 90 cases. Not very many cases get to court for strangulation. 39 offenders were charged, so that means only half of those people were charged, um, but only 14 resulted in convictions. So it's a really hard charge to prove. And it's interesting, because if you go back to the, to the law, the law actually was never intended for domestic violence or sexual assault or anything else. It actually goes back to the, the Garroting uh, Wars in the late eight, or the early 1800s in Britain. It's actually, the law as it's written in Canada is basically a paraphrase of the, um, of the law as it was written in 1874. And the garroting charges was, um, what would happen was, it, or the garroting riots in, in Britain were happening was that people were going and basically putting a small ligature around somebody's neck, incapacitating them and robbing them. And that uh, was a, a big thing in the early 1800s. And so in 1874, the UK brought out this law. And it hasn't actually changed since that. So. What I find kind of interesting is I will buy dinner for anybody who can tell me what um, uh, Rule 245 is of the criminal code, what the offense is for 245 or 247. I'll buy you two dinners. So, so, so this one is kind of stuck off in the middle of nowhere. So uh, charge 245 is actually poisoning. Uh, so, it could, so, so overcoming resistance and strangulation comes after poisoning, but it comes before booby traps. So if you set a trap for somebody, that's uh, offense 247. So anyways, in all my spare time, I sit, or I sit down and I read the criminal code. Um, so, so what it means is it's not super high on the priority. So strangulation, signs and symptoms. I'm not going to go through this a lot because you guys actually know this. Um, whether or not you recognize it, or recognize it in the context of somebody who may not be telling you a full story um, is maybe another, another issue. One of the things I do want to um, point out and mention is that we don't have a lot of information about strangulation. There's not a lot of studies looking at strangulation. There are some studies looking at hangings, and, and those, that's probably our best estimate for hanging, for um, what actually the physiology of what happens with a, with a strangulation um, injury. And a lot of the information that comes on hangings is actually from Annie Savageau, who was the chief medical examiner in Alberta. I don't think she's still there. Um, but she, basically what she did was she looked at videotaped hangings, basically snuff films. Uh, people had either made that were um, suicides or um, uh, autoerotic sort of things. And what she did was she classified these. And basically what she found was that you know, people would hang. So these all had a suspension except for one, so 14 of them, um, and looked at these and saw if there was any sort of physiological things that she could pick up. Basically, people lose consciousness between 10 and 18 seconds. They do decorticate and then decerebrate sort of posturing. Some have a seizure. And then there's some last agonal sort of rest somewhere between two and four minutes, depending on, on um, you know, what the, the, the victim or patient was, you know, how long it took. So, but it's very consistent. 10 seconds, you lose consciousness. So what we've done is we've tried to kind of translate that to what do we see clinically with people? And the point I want to make is that sometimes people will come in and say, I can't tell you what happened. I don't know. And if you think about it, if it only takes 10 seconds to lose consciousness, then that person's not going to necessarily know what's happened, right? Um, not only that, that whole losing consciousness sort of thing, it impairs your memory. You can't lay down memory in a normal way if you're unconscious, right? So, so the neurological things, it's not that the person's not trying to tell you a story. They may not know, okay? And then if you throw drugs or alcohol and other things on top of it, it's, it becomes a, a bit of a quagmire. So a lot of the symptoms that people complain about are a bit soft, right? Um, Again, I can print this out for anybody if you want it. It's, it's actually not a bad summary. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit dumbed down. It's, it's primarily actually for EMS and for uh, police providers just so that they can recognize some of the things. Um, you know, some of the bigger things, chest pain, um, redness, scratch marks, you know, scratch marks to the neck. 
And this isn't, you know, and, and the defense will always say, oh, well, you know, but my client was injured and she, she, she was, you know, she attacked him. Well, it's actually, somebody's trying to claw away what is on the, on the neck, okay? So these are often self-inflicted sort of linear um, sort of scratch marks that you'll see. I would hope that if you, if you saw any of these sort of signs that you would at least, you know, pay attention to that because um, you're never going to see them all together like this. Okay, here's uh, somebody with a mark on their neck, okay? Now, it's not a great picture because it only has, I only have one view of it. But you can see that there's something that looks to be at least partially cir circumferential on this view. It was actually circumferential. This was a hanging, okay? Um, and it was actually a ligature mark. Uh, now, I know that the people elsewhere can't see my pointer if I use the laser printer, but you can see here there's actually a bit of a patterned abrasion, and there's a, actually a little abrasion here too. So, these are the petechiae that we're talking about. This is also a hanging. Uh, there is some a little bit of a, maybe a bruise there and maybe a bruise or an abrasion there. But these are those petechiae that we're talking about. Um, petechiae are caused in strangulation. The petechiae are from little uh, burst tiny capillaries. And the, the pathophysiology isn't 100% certain, but it's, it's probably as good as it gets. And it uh, comes from the chief medical examiner of New York State from about, uh, he died uh, recently, but uh, from 1986, Charles Hirsch. And he was talking about what, what, is the, what is this cause? Is this anoxic blood vessel damage or is there a mechanical issue? What we think that this is caused by is that if you think you've got pressure on the neck, what gets occluded first? It's going to be your vein, venous system, right? Low pressure system. And then um, higher pressure system, which is going to be the capillary, or sorry, the um, arteries, and then probably airway last, okay, if you had to sort of quantify things from force. And so petechiae are caused by the fact that you're compressing the veins, but not necessarily the arteries. So you've got backflow. It's kind of like, you know, think about uh, your garden hose, right, before we had water restrictions, and you go and stand on the garden hose. The first thing that happens is your your spray of water is kind of half as high because you're standing on the hose. But, you know, if you've got a hose like mine, you stand on the hose and you spring a little leak. You get a little proximal to where you're standing. Okay, that's basically what's causing petechiae in this sort of case. So that's the, the pathophysiology for that. And so what's sort of characteristic with a hanging or a strangulation is that they're above the site of obstruction. Okay? And they can be florid like this or it can just be a few. And it depends a little bit on lots of different features. You know, if there's other issues, other, you know, tissue damage, you may not see these. Or if the force is so strong that the arter arteries get occluded as well, then you may not see it. Okay? Petechial bleeding is very close to the surface of the skin. And this may resolve very quickly, within 24 hours. It can last for weeks. Okay? Up to two weeks. So, the bad things. This is the stuff that you guys need to worry about. Okay, I don't know about you, but I kind of go in to see my patient and I sort of, in my head, I'm thinking, what are the five things that are going to kill this person in the next, whatever, two hours? And how am I going to sort that out? And then the rest I don't really care about. So these are the things that are going to kill this person. Um, airway stuff, cardiovascular, and neuro. Um, I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through a lot of these, okay? Because you guys know all this stuff. I'm, 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 I don't have to teach you this. Um, Vocal cord paralysis is one I never really appreciated. Um, somebody grabs you around the neck, you know, so you can get like a neuropraxia of the, of the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. What, uh, resident, one of the residents here, if you paralyze a vocal cord, what position it, is it in when you laryngoscope them? Open, closed. Uh, any of the attendings want to answer that? <laughs> If you have a paralyzed, just one, say one vocal cord. A paralyzed vocal cord is closed, okay? So if you look down, you should normally get your nice little triangle of your vocal cords like this. A paralyzed vocal cord is like this, okay? It's like laryngospasm. So but this doesn't necessarily, and what do you do when you're looking down and you see somebody with laryngospasm? Your sphincter tightens a little bit, right? And then what do you do? Yeah, you suck. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so so vocal cord paralysis is is a really big finding that, that we can get with this. Okay, so that person that comes in a little bit hoarse, we need to look at their airway and make sure that those vocal cords are actually moving. 
They close. <laughs> Paralyzed someone for rapid sequence intubation, you the vocal cords are paralyzed, but yeah. they're open. But, but they're they're not they're not they're not movable, right? Like they're not. How do you say it? There's that little tiny slit, and that's all you're seeing. And if you and when the patient breathes, if you're doing a laryngoscopy and you haven't given them sucks, the paralyzed vocal cords are going to sit, and the one that's not paralyzed moves, right? And so a, a, a one from a, a vocal cord paralysis is not going anywhere, and it's basically, there's, even if you have both of them closed, what do you see? Tiny little slit, right? Not much. So we'll go, go back to that. Carotid artery dissection, vertebral artery dissection. I know in my 20 years or so of doing emergency medicine, I picked up probably only three or four vertebral artery dissections. One was from a woman who was having a chiropractic manipulation of her neck. One was of a snowboarder who happened to be looking to the side and got struck and fell. And one was with a, a strangulation injury. So those are the ones I know about. I probably missed two or three dozen of them, though. Um, arrhythmias, I put that in with a question mark because we don't really know why people die with strangulation injury. There's probably something to do with the carotid body being um, compressed. That's uh, still a little bit controversial. The last one I really want to sort of point out here is Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So who gets that? Yeah, that's like, like being punch drunk, right? Like the so MM, what, what do you call it? mixed martial arts guys, boxers, football players, soccer players. Guess what? Domestic violence victims too. So um, that's sort of evolving literature and stuff that's sort of in the works right now. Okay, so this uh, I put this in from the context of if you're a medical student or a resident, and you're working with your attending. Uh, what do you? you know, what, what do you do and how do you work this up? And the thing is, is that there's not a lot of great protocols. And, and, you know, every department's a little bit different. Everybody does things differently. It depends on your, your relationship with, with um, radiology. But proper investigation is going to be some combination of, of, prop, of investigations. It can be x-ray, bronchoscopy, vascular studies, depending on what's sort of available. But it was a bit of a mishmash, and it is a bit of a mishmash. So what sort of came of this is that there have been sort of working groups looking at what should we be doing for strangulation and hanging injuries to identify the life-threatening things. This is where this comes from. I know this is really busy. We're going to go through parts of it, so don't worry if you can't read it all. So um, I was very fortunate to recently go down to San Diego. Uh, I was invited down to be part of this tra training institute of strangulation prevention, um, which is sponsored by the U.S. Federal Department of Justice. And it was looking at basically identifying and how to prosecute strangulation injury from um, generally the U.S. perspective. And um, it was quite an interesting experience. Uh, this is what they um, have come up with. Not they, but this is sort of consensus from eMERGE docs that are doing clinical forensic medicine um, and uh, pathologists on what we should be doing uh, and also radiologists to work up strangulation injury. So... Uh, the main thing here that we're doing is evaluating the carotid and the vertebral arteries, um, looking for bony and cartilaginous issues, and evaluate the brain for anoxic injury. So how does that fit into what we do here? Okay. I'm going to throw this picture up here. This is one of those ones that's kind of bad things, right? You can see, somebody want to take a stab at this? Just a, just a, you know, part of what we do in eMERGE is injury interpretation, right? Somebody want to try and describe, describe that? Bruising to the neck to start. Yeah? Kind of wedge shaped. Again, I only have that one picture. Swelling. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's probably a little bit of swelling here too. And in fact, you actually can get some appreciation that there's maybe some areas where the bruising looks a little bit more intense. There's sort of four sort of things there. And then some more sort of diffuse swelling over the larynx and stuff. Okay. So I would, if you guys saw that, patient's voice is normal, what would you do? Like, I know what I do, or I know what I do now, and I know what I used to do. I'd say, you having any trouble swelling? No? Okay, see you later. Okay. So this protocol was sort of brought up to try and address these things that we're missing and how to do it. Okay, so we're going to focus on this. History and or physical exam with any of the following. 
okay? And it gives nice little lists of symptoms. And again, I'm not gonna go through all these because you guys know what a petechia is. You know, you know, when you see something that looks like a band around the neck, you can probably make some sort of conclusion that might have been a ligature. Um, incontinence, okay? Bowel and bladder, okay? What happens when you get strangled and you lose consciousness in that 10 to 18 seconds? Often people will defecate and wet themselves and they'll have no recall of why they did it. That's because they're unconscious. Um, dysphonia, aphonia, dyspnea, sub-Q emphysema. Those are, you know, the big, big ones, okay? What are you going to do? Depends on where you work a little bit. So, fortunately, we've kind of gone through all this um, with this uh, protocol, the workup of this protocol. Now, different things are going to be available to different people. Uh, what I did was I... I looked at this and I took it to the rads at BGH and said, what do you guys think of this? They loved it. They loved it. They said, bring it on. Put it as part of our, our, our workup because, but they said, you know what? It's not us who has trouble knowing what to do. He said, but it's, it's, not, it's not being identified. So the first thing I would say that comes out of this is make friends with your radiology department. This isn't what it was like 20 odd years ago where everything was a bun fight over whether or not you could get a head CT scan, okay? <laughs> These people, if they've had a loss of consciousness or amnesia, you're probably going to be CTing their head anyways, right? It doesn't take a lot to carry on and go down. And it's, I don't know, it, it's been a while since I worked at St. Paul's, but it's pretty easy to get a CT angio, at least at VGH, to look at vertebral arteries and things. And, um, and it's just a matter of talking to radiology, okay? If you can't do that, at least a CT neck with contrast. Talk to them. They want to do this stuff. And they want to be like us. They want to educate us, right? They love it. Um, so the rats were, were pretty on board with this. MRA of the neck, uh, MRI of the neck, a lot more difficult to get in Canada. It's something that they're, they're using a little bit more in the States. Um, ultrasound, probably not something that's going to help you too much here. Okay? Especially me, I'm terrible at ultrasound. So. Trace? Yeah. Sorry. Um... So these are recommended for which patients? So these are for strangulation patients. I would actually trans transfer that and actually say I would also do it for hanging patients. And in fact, recently I saw somebody who was a clothesline injury with an MVA. Um, he actually had atlanto occipital dissociation. Um, and uh, but you know these kind of vascular studies are important to anybody who's being kind of lifted. Right? Like, because it's usually a traction injury that's just causing the dissection, not always. But so I would say that this is specifically for strangulation, but I would actually t take it for hangings and for clothesline type injuries. Okay, uh, Eric first. So, so just to be clear, so someone comes in, they said they were strangled, they have bruises on. Yeah, I have a mark or whatever. Yep. They have a mark, but they feel okay. They otherwise, they, I mean, you're, you're doing this for every patient who's. I, I actually am. And you know what? That's how I picked up the other one. She came in two weeks after, right, with her vertebral artery dissection. What was it? Her, her symptoms. Her symptoms was were headache and ongoing difficulty swallowing. I'm not sure what the difficulty swallowing was. No. So, so in fact, because that's a question that comes up all the time. How long do you have to do these studies for, or, what, or what's your window? Six months. They're saying here six months. Okay, and uh, and because it does put you at risk for these things. Do we treat vertebral artery dissections? Not really, but we do put them on in. I, just, in, I want to be clear that the, the, the recommendation, anybody who's had any kind of strangulation, whether they lost consciousness or not, mm -hmm. you're, you're recommending this? Or are you yeah. telling people yeah. if symptoms change? Or I, I am. When they come in with some, like they say, I was strangled and it's, you know, whatever, a week later, four days later, or two weeks later, I'm, I'm doing what these. If and if they come in later. acutely, if they come in acutely, I'm doing it as well. So, and you know what? I want to say that my false negative rate is really, really high. But how many patients, or sorry, my false, like I'm not, get, I'm, like, I'm not getting positive studies in a lot of these, okay? Um, how many patients do you order a, a CT chest on for a, a D-dimer of 618, right? We, None if they're well, <laughs> You know, but, but we we've had to become a little bit, you know, we have to become cautious because we're missing things. And 
I don't have a huge baseline to know that, because I'm not sure what my baseline is of how many patients are coming in. But I think that by not doing these, and be, that we are missing them, because I've actually now seen a couple of these that were not part of SAS or anything else, that, uh, and I'll show you a couple of pictures in a minute of, of other patients coming in. Uh, sorry, Andy and then Todd had a question too. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. I guess I'm, I'm wrestling with this one a little bit because if yep. they really have, um, you know, maybe they're brought in because the police brought them in because there was an assault or something. And so mm -hmm. they're not really, they tell you they were strangled. They're not having any symptoms. Maybe uh -huh. they didn't even lose consciousness. Mm -hmm. You don't see any external trauma. Okay. It, and a lot of these women are young reproductive age, you know, yeah. so these are also the people we're yeah. trying to avoid CTs on. Yeah. So in that patient, you would still feel that you're, um, I'm going to give you a list. The other side of this list is the ones we don't necessarily have to investigate. Okay. okay? And then I also will show you the little discharge sheet that we send people home with so that they know what to come back for. Okay? What, I'm, what I want to do is try and put it on people's radar because there, there's lots of places to stumble here. Uh, if, you know, if police get called to a domestic violence or whatever, you know, the police miss the boat. Okay, they may see that this person's got, you know, bleeding into the whites of their eyes and that she's hoarse and she's hysterical and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you know, they, they, they're not necessarily picking up on those signs. Because of that, ambulance isn't necessarily getting called and the patient's not being asked to seek medical attention. The patient comes to you, they emerge, and, you know, like, we're like, what the hell are you here for? You know, you, you seem fine, right? And, and people kind of get blown off. And you know what? I admit that sitting in the waiting room for four hours, you know, waiting to get seen is kind of a way of observing them. Um, but I think it's probably important to do these, these studies. Um, I've been a little bit surprised by the fact that, that um, I have picked up some of these. It just kind of almost randomly and almost, almost ones that I wouldn't necessarily have expected. So I will go over the ones. Sorry, Todd, did you have a question too? You're good. Okay. We'll go over the ones you don't have to investigate. Uh, this has got the colored arrow sign. Anybody want to have a go at it? Does anybody look at plain films anymore? But at least it's not the one that you have to put up. Somebody stick their hand up and tell me what this is. What are those arrows pointing at? Continuous diaphragm sign. Okay, you see the diaphragm all the way along here. You don't usually see the diaphragm where the heart sits on top of it. So the pneumomediastinum. Okay, see it on the lateral aspect too. This CT showed air all around the arch of the aorta and around. So I had a, a really interesting case here at St. Paul's about three years ago with a guy who came in on, I still remember this, January 4th, and on Christmas or New Year's Eve, he'd been having sex with his partner and the, had a strangulation episode. She strangled him. It was consensual. And uh, he came in, whatever, four days later, and he said, every time I turn my head, I get this weird popping sound. I don't get it. And, uh, and he had subcutaneous emphysema that went from basically the, his clavicles all the way up uh, into his occiput. And uh, he had a pneumomediastinum. And uh, it was really, to me, it was really interesting. And it also sort of I, you know, I thought I should probably write this up from a point of view. There's not a lot of, you know, there are lots of case reports about, you know, bilateral carotid artery dissections, vertebral artery dissections. There's not actually a lot about pneumomediastinum with consensual, consensual sex. But. Okay, so you see that pneumomediastinum. You see that, the bruising. You get the investigations. What do you do now? Okay. Now, again, this gets a little bit wishy-washy, right? It depends on what your resources are. It depends on what the patient's resources are. Basically, what they're saying from the case reports and what's happening in other places in the world, any positive radiology findings, patients should be consulted and admit, like consulted to a service and admitted. And this is actually even happening in the states where people don't have health insurance. Um, negative radiology findings, observe, and they're actually recommending up to 24 hours and then discharge, okay? I, you know, I, I'm not wedded to that uh, in an ideal world, maybe, but okay. So if you, this is that same graph. I'm going to put the graph back up again. But, you know, if you've got some findings, positive findings, consult neurology, neurosurge, trauma, whoever, for admission, um, consider ENT, somebody to actually look at the larynx. 
sometimes easier than done, okay, it's said than done. Uh, if they don't have any findings, continue hospital observation. And again, the recommendations have been up to 24 hours. If you look at the ASAP guidelines on strangulation, which are written by Bill Green, who's one of the guys who did this protocol with Bill Smock, um, they'll say 24 hours. But, and then discharge home with detailed instru instructions, and I'll show you those in a sec. Okay, so the, who doesn't need investigation? Sure, go for it. We do, we we do, but we're sorry. The question is, um, if, if for example this happened at VGH and the patient say gets admitted to the trauma service, does the sexual assault service or whatever round or 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 um, follow that patient? And I would say we're primarily a consulting service, but. Yes, I like we would do that. That would be probably my patient. Um, now, I recognize that not everywhere has a sexual assault ser service, uh, and also not everywhere has a trauma service. So, and this is where we get into that whole bun fight again about it's like the little subdurals, right? The that you know end up getting at St. Paul's admitted to medicine, but they don't really want them because they might decompensate. Have things changed? Things probably haven't changed, right? So, anyways, so it, that part's going to be a battle. Okay, but if you can get these people admitted to somewhere, and I would say actually trauma would probably be a perfect sort of place for them, um, that, that, would, that would be ideal. And yes, uh, we would follow that patient. And just uh, for the record, if at St. Paul's, if people are admitted, uh, say to ICU, following a sexual assault or whatever, if they're an admitted patient or to psych or whatever, sexual assault service will actually come uh, to St. Paul's and follow those patients as well. So, okay. Okay, who doesn't need investigations? Anybody who doesn't have a loss of consciousness, doesn't have sort of visual changes, no petechial hemorrhages, no evidence of any soft tissue injury to the neck. Remember, 50% of patients don't have any soft tissue findings. Uh, no dyspnea, no neuro symptoms, like they didn't seize or anything. And, and I love this, reliable home monitoring. Okay, that one's always a bit tough, right? Like if partner beats up partner, I, you know, I'm not sure about safety planning there, but um, that becomes part of your discharge planning, okay? D discharge home with detailed instructions to return to the emergency department. Okay. So there's the whole sort of framework again. I just kind of broke it down so it was sort of a little bit uh, sort of in sort of the workable sort of sides of things, okay? Um, have we instituted this? at anywhere. I've spoken to RADS, I've spoken a little bit to the VGH people. I, I, you know, it's, it's something I feel really passionate about. Um, I do think that it's something that we can, um, we can improve on. And uh, part of it is just not knowing what to do. So, okay. Uh, and did anybody see the BOG people when, uh, did you guys know about the BOG people? These are uh, people that were uh, thrown into a BOG in Denmark probably 2,500 years ago, and they were essentially perfectly preserved because of the tannins in the bog. And uh, this is one of the bog people. Look what he's got around his neck. He's got a ligature around his neck. And I remember seeing this about 20 years ago when I was in Ottawa for something, and it was just kind of a, anyways. And uh, at that point in time, became quite interested in the fact that this guy had been preserved with his ligature around his neck. But, uh, brief word about documentation. Uh, ER charts are really hopeless. Uh, we write so little on them. <laughs> and what is usually written is pretty much illegible. Dictations are probably a little bit more useful. Um, I personally am still trying to learn how to use the dictation system at St. Paul's, or pardon me, at, at VGH. Um, but especially if there's pertinent negatives that are listed. Pictures. They, it would be great to be able to take pictures of these people. Often I only get the context of the pictures if the police have been involved. Um, and the police are pretty good. They um, generally try to take pictures in the emergency department, and then they'll, they'll usually do another set of pictures about a week later, uh, just to show sort of the evolution of the injury and stuff. And uh, and when I get involved from a going to court point of view, it's usually on the basis of pictures because I haven't necessarily seen the patient. And then the trauma gram. Now again, our trauma grams are not great, and the ones that are on the trauma handouts aren't great. But we actually have one for the sexual assault service, which is a strangulation checklist, and I'll show that to you. You guys are welcome to have that or use that if you think it's useful. 
Um, remember to include the things that are important and make sure that when you discharge your patient that they know what to come back for, okay? Any signs of a stroke, for example, or increasing difficulty with their breathing. So here's our SAS strangulation um, checklist. Uh, it's just helpful because it, help, it reminds you to sort of try and ask about some of the symptoms that you may not have um, specifically remembered. You know, was there bruising around the mouth? Uh, or is there a laceration? Is that from maybe somebody putting something over the person's face as well, or a hand, right? Um, you know, redness under the chin. What's the first thing you do if somebody does this to you? What's the first thing you do? Do this, right? And you do this. So often people have sort of abrasions under the chin. Um, so that's, uh, you know, those are the little things to kind of look for. You wouldn't necessarily think about that. You might think, oh, she might, maybe she lost consciousness and fell and hit her chin. Okay, that could be part of it too. But, you know, somebody suddenly puts a hand over your, your mouth. You're going to get blunt force trauma to the, to the mouth and the lip and, you know, often a split laceration to the, to the lip, those kind of things. So um, I'm not asking anybody to be an expert in injury interpretation, but just think of things in the context of, of what you're seeing or, or maybe what you're hearing. Okay. This is our strangulation form that we hand out to patients with the sexual assault service. And I love the bottom uh, because it basically it says, if you get any of these symptoms, go to eMERGE. <laughs> and then the eMERGE doc, I've, I've had two experiences where the eMERGE doc kind of looked at this and says, why are you here, right? So um, we're, we are asking people to come back and uh, at least be evaluated. Um, you know, and I hope that all of those studies are negative, but uh, I, don't, I don't think they will be once we start doing a little bit more of them. So uh, this is a slide that I put in for my sexual assault examiners who are nurses, okay? Not all of our examiners are physicians on the sexual assault service, um, but it actually goes out to the residents and to the medical students as well. You know, like anything, if you kind of go in and you're kind of like, oh, I'm not, this isn't sitting well for me, talk to your attending, okay? Um, educate yourself, learn about these things. How did I get into this? I, I, I'll be with the It wasn't because, you know, I watched all these, you know, snuff films with Annie Savageau. That was not my thing. You know, I got interested in this because I had a patient who hanged himself in my psych unit here at St. Paul's and uh, resuscitated this guy. And so um, there was in my face. And what I recognized was that there weren't a lot of people who knew very much about strangulation injury. And when I went to court on that case, there, you know, there was not a lot of people who knew a lot about strangulation injury. So it pays to educate yourself, and then when you educate yourself, you, ed you get to educate other people. So um, if you see a strangulation case, and you're a resident, or you're one of the attendings, go back, read about it, ask somebody about it, talk to me. I, like, you know, this is, you need to educate yourself. And also, educate the police officers, educate the nursing staff. These are important things. Um, I've got some resources at the end that I can pass on for people that, you know, you've got 20 minutes one night when you're trying to set up your Netflix, you can look at this stuff. It's easy and it's fast and you'll get it. Um, support your patient, safety planning, violence resources. Sorry, Jim. Mm -hmm. Five minutes, okay. All right, your role as an EP. Recognize that strangulation is probably, or is a potentially life-threatening injury. This is what I want you to take home, okay? Investigate it as thoroughly as you can. Talk to the radiology. They are on board with this. They want this, okay? They love being able to show us stuff and learn from them, okay? Go and talk to them afterwards. Say, what is that CT scan? Show me that pneumomedius dynam. Show me that dissection. Um, CTA is probably gonna be the easiest thing to get here. Uh, prudent observation referral in an ideal world, it would be great to be able to have that. Identify that strangulation injury in the context of interpersonal violence is a marker for a need for a really detailed risk assessment. You know what? You can't send this person back home to this sort of situation. If they choose that that's what they want to do, at least give them the resources so that they know, you know, you can start a little bit of a safety plan and all this. We are really crappy at that, okay? That's what social work is for. That's what your helpers are for, okay? Um, so a few thanks to uh, Bill Smock in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and the U.S. Federal Department of Justice, Justice. References, if you get a chance, try and go to Strangulation Training Institute. Um, I send a lot of the police and stuff there. They've got some really quick sort of five-minute videos, got some pretty good references and stuff. These were references that I used. These are the references for how they got to that protocol for the radiology stuff, okay? I know that some, one of you keeners is going to go research all of those, okay? But anyways, it's all there. And that's pretty much it.
questions. I got like one minute of questions. You got a few minutes. <laughs> really interesting, Tracy. Can you, sort of tra a tangential question a little bit, but can you, you talk about um, what is the, the duty or the responsibility of the emergency physician if you have some, let's say it was a very violent crime even, and you investigate it and, um, and, and everything's okay, they can be discharged home and they don't want to do anything about it. They want to go right back into that domestic situation. I mean, do we have any obligation to do anything about it? We just say, adios, you're on your own. No, Good we luck. don't. In, Canada, in, in British Columbia and in Canada, we don't have an obligation to report that. Um, that's not the case in all of the states. But um, the, what, what I say to them is, we are always here in the emergency department. You can come back anytime. Maybe a bit of a wait, but anyways. And I, I give them that opportunity. I make sure that they're connected with social work. And, um, and in fact, we have some really subtle ways of being able to give people information. There's like the little card they can put in their shoe. Actually, with sexual assault service, we have a little, um, it's a nail file, like just that you would use, like an emery board. Actually has the phone number for like WAVA on it. So there are sort of ways to give people some information. But basically, try and link them with a social worker. And that's going to be the best you can do. It's a really kind of bad situation. And the other thing I would say is, don't interview this person with partner right there, right? So like that's a really important thing and it sounds a little bit of a no-brainer. And so the way that I've gotten around this is, you know what, um, I see you've got a really sore throat and, and you know I'm a little bit concerned about this. I need to do some investigations, okay? And in fact, I talk to them in the CT scanner <laughs> and that's where I, I sometimes get a, a bit of the information, okay? So you sometimes have to be a little bit covert. Yeah. Frank. Hey, Tracy. Uh, it's been a while since uh, all of us have seen you. I've known you for 10 years, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all, I know, just, I think most people know Tracy's used to work here and now works at VGH. I've never seen you so confident and poised as this, <laughs> and it's obvious you're passionate about this, and I think that translates to everybody in the room, so congratulations on, on really a great talk that we get no exposure to. My, my question is uh, going to be has to do with, um, obviously, you work at a center where you can get pretty much anything you want fairly quickly, and, uh, you know, what about the 95 or 98 hospitals in British Columbia, which do not have a trauma service, do not have any kind of radiology, and you're going to get a patient coming in saying three days ago, so-and-so did this at a couple drinks, I might have lost consciousness, and I was, my voice was hoarse for a day or two. Yeah. Like, w what do you do in any other hospital in British Columbia? Yeah, you, you know what, the, the answer is... And you perhaps, do, perhaps David could comment yeah. on that too after Tracy has her yeah. shot at it. Yeah, you do the best you can. Um, use your resources. Like, uh, there is the... Eric, what the hell is that called? The 1-800-call-and-emerge-doc dot com line like what is that there's that ray cd so you know what so if somebody calls you can you know maybe arrange that uh, some of these patients may need to be transferred okay and you know from a we're also looking at this also from a sexual assault perspective too and we do recognize that there are some patients that we need to transfer uh for sexual assault there are, there's also, in some cases, maybe the ability to transfer the sexual assault service to the patient. So, you know, there is there is some ideas of being able to transfer. I don't. You do the best you can. Most places, I think, in BC, you can get a CT scan. Really? Like I think. Ish, ish, within six hours. You know, like. Yeah. Okay. You know what? You do the best you can. You know what you do. You do what we've been doing for the last 30 years. Keep your fingers crossed as well, right? So somebody else, uh, but you were you referred to David Essler? Yeah. yeah. Are there any cases, CFPA cases or anything that you, you've been involved with? Or not? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Fire away? On another note, happy to uh, see any patients from sexual assault service. If you guys have questions about um, patients who have been sexually assaulted, just call the number. There's, a, there's like a call switchboard, and you will be able to talk to one of the sexual assault nurses or examiners, and we'll be able to walk you through what needs to be done or how to transfer the patient. So, okay. And Thank just uh, as a aside, Tracy has also been consulting with the Emergency Services Advisory Committee, setting up um, the approach to sexual assault in all of the regions of British Columbia, including smaller hospitals. And so there's regional protocol 